start out by introducing Michael before we ask him for a little bit of show and tell. So Michael is a chiropractor based out of Harrisonburg, Virginia. He owns and operates Shenandoah Valley Performance Clinic and specializes in the rehabilitation of neuromuscular, um, neuromusculoskeletal issues, associated pain, and dysfunction. He enjoys helping people from various backgrounds return to their desired level of activity. His primary goals for working with clients, educate, um, educate about their situation and collaboratively design a game plan to move them from where they are to where they would like to be. Um, so we're very much looking forward to Michael's presentation, but prior to that, I'm going to make him the star of the show and ask him to share a little something um, about himself. Sure, can you guys hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. All right, yeah, I'm so bad at these things. Um, but uh, the only thing I could think of is I have a medal with me this morning. Um, probably a big part of like my identity throughout uh, adulthood is I started competing in what most people label like resistance training sports. So I, I did bodybuilding in 2003, I got into it, and then that medal's from 2012, and then uh, I've done CrossFit competitions and powerlifting competitions most recently. So that's probably like a fun fact about me. And then uh, that kind of translates a lot to my clinical practice. I, I work with a lot of folks who enjoy physical activity and then specifically resistance training and uh, what we call barbell sports. Awesome. Very interesting and, and very fun and very much, um, I don't know, at least from a PT perspective, which is my perspective, um, I love it when people lift heavy things and enjoy activity. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we try to encourage that as much as we can. Absolutely. Okay, well, now we're going to move on to Michael's presentation, Pain Exploring the Human Experience. Right. Well, I guess I can take this off for today. Unfortunately, I can't be there in person to give this presentation. Uh, as you guys know, with COVID-19 and everything ongoing, that the summit has moved to online, to a virtual summit. But hopefully uh, we can have discussions in October about about this lecture I'm about to give and then as well about the other lectures that people are going to be giving this weekend. So uh, my name is Dr. Michael Ray. I'm a chiropractor in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I also work remotely for a company called Barbell Medicine, where we try to help individuals who are having pain experiences return to some level of desired activity based on their goals. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the human experience of pain today. And we're going to try to make this a collaborative discussion as much as possible, given the constraints of pre-recording. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, probably a bit of a different context than most people are used to as it relates to the linguistic underpinnings of the human experience of pain. And so throughout this presentation, you're going to see a couple of images. And I just want to thank the photographer, Justin Wee, for allowing me to use these images throughout the presentation today. Uh, he did a, an article um, uh, about pain in essence, as an object uh, with the BBC, I highly recommend people go and check out uh, that, that write-up with Justin. He did an uh, amazing job with this photo shoot. And, and in essence, people wrote in who had been dealing with persistent pain, and they wrote in and described their experiences with various you know, uh, language and analogies and metaphors and similes. And then Justin created props and, and, and took photographs in an attempt to encapsulate or encompass uh, what the person had described as their pain experience. So I think he did an excellent job. And so you'll see those photos sprinkled throughout the presentation. Please go check out um, the write-up at BBC and read more about this. I do want to take just a little bit of time and read about the first photograph that you see here on today's presentation. And I just want to read to you what one of the individuals wrote in. And so this was from someone who's dealing with persistent uh, back pain. And so the individual says, my pain feels inescapable and unreachable. It is behind me and below my viewpoint. There are levels and there is a surface to the pain, but the core of the problem is deep and far below somewhere I can reach. Maybe if I was a diver, I would try to swim down to it, retrieve the cause, excavate the central point, and each time I would run out of breath as I got closer, just out of reach, before I would have to float to the surface for air. And I think if we look at the image that uh, has been captured here to encapsulate those words and encompass those words, we can see the meshing of language with imagery and we kind of demonstrating how someone's having an experience in which we're using the label of pain to describe or qualify that experience. 
And I think it gets at kind of the pervasiveness that persistent pain can, can impose on someone in their life um, and influence both how they view themselves and then the world around them. And we'll talk about some of that today. So we have three primary objectives for today. The first I've already alluded to, which is going to be looking at the linguistic underpinnings of the word pain, which is then going to naturally lead into talking about models and frameworks and clinical practice in which we use to examine the human who's experiencing pain. And then that's going to build into the final objective today for talking about how we can be guides in clinical practice. And, and one of the focal points being a collaborative exploration of someone's experience, which could lead to education about their experience. And so we'll try to go through each of these today. Uh, they are uh, very involved topics, so I'm going to do my best to kind of give broad strokes for each of these, but I encourage folks to go read some of the citations that I'll provide for the presentation. So let's talk about the uh, first thing with the first objective. I want to pose two questions to kind of kick things off. On the left, you can see a question, what is pain? And then on the right, you can see a question, why am I in pain? Now, I think in clinical practice, um, I don't think it's purpose purposeful, but I think just how our healthcare system is set up, especially in the States, is we very quickly find ourselves trying to answer the question, why am I in pain? So someone presents to the clinic and they're seeking aid from someone, from the clinician, and they're trying to help them answer the question, why am I in pain? I want to first start with us talking about trying to answer the question, what is pain? And I think if we try to start with that question first, that's going to have pretty impactful influence into answering the question, why am I in pain? And I think oftentimes we just unfortunately uh, either, uh, I don't think it's purposeful, but we jump over answering the question, what is pain? And so that's where we're gonna begin this discussion today. So what is it? What is pain? Well, quite simplistically and, and linguistically, pain is a word. Pain is a word that we use to attach to our lived experiences. And so as a word, someone may have various lived experiences in which they take that word pain and they attach it as a label to those experiences. I really like what Borg said here, and this is from her 2013 article on the uh, Prothero lecture about pain. It is helpful to begin from the premise that pain is not an object, it is a type of event. Pain is a way of being in the world. So we're not necessarily objectifying uh, the, the experience of pain, and more importantly, we're saying that uh, as an event, where we use the word pain to describe or qualify the event, it's a way of existing in the world. And you're gonna see that theme throughout this presentation today. So it can't be overstated though, that although it may be a word that we use at the individual level, there are massive societal and cultural influences into the utilization of the word pain and when it has contextual appropriateness. So the word pain is obviously codified in society. Society gives it construct, it gives it systematic application and appropriateness for use. And we see this even at a very young age, uh, linguistic development in early childhood with the word pain, is, depending on the citation you look at, is between the ages of three to six years old. And so oftentimes, before that, prior to that, uh, children will use words such as ouch or ow or even hurt to express things like feeling unwell or sickness or uh, direct tissue damage that they've experienced as a child. And so I think it could probably argue that that may be one of the times in life that the utilization of those words to describe our experiences are quite reflexive, uh, denoting our experiences. But then we see later in life, uh, as the child develops, when you get to that three to six uh, years of age, then they start using the more complicated word pain to qualify or label their experiences and to communicate what they're experiencing. And so when they do this, um, you know, there's obvious cognitive development that's occurred to allow that to happen, but more importantly, there's also societal and cultural influences during that development period. And so society is going to have a massive influence that we could see different words used uh, in different contexts of the word pain used based on the social and cultural influences, during, especially during development. And so the child's going to have indirect experiences with learning about the word pain. And these indirect experiences can be observations of others, hearing what others say, um, and, and can influence the development. There's a couple of citations I'll put in the references, but they even talk about how if a child has experienced uh, in early life interactions with healthcare professionals, that's going to influence their word usage here. If they have siblings, that's going to influence their word usage. 
So we know that there's going to be cognitive developments related to this process. There's going to be indirect experience related to this process of using the word pain to label an experience. And there's going to be direct experience on the behalf of the child in which they have their lived experiences and they have various experiences in which they learn to apply the label pain. Now in clinical practice, we're often very much focused on the individual. Naturally, that presents to our office. But again, we can't overstate the societal influences into the development of the, the word pain and then the usage of it. I'm a bit of an armchair philosopher. I'm not classically cha uh, trained. There's a lot of things that I don't know about the topic uh, or the field of philosophy, but I have read Wittgenstein and I really like something that he said in Philosophical Investigations, which is line 384. You learn the concept pain when you learn language. And I think that holds true. The society has codified the term, has taught us how to use the word, and has uh, demonstrated appropriateness for using the word. Uh, and it, it's different from culture to culture and society to society. But we are very much influenced by uh, the usage of the word at the individual level through our learned uh, experiences. And I just want to talk about two kind of anecdotes that are applicable to me to kind of drive this point home further. Myself, growing up, I participated in a lot of sports, but one in particular that I really enjoyed was mixed martial arts. And in this culture, you become accustomed to having a lot of physical contact. You're either punched or you're kicked. You may even be choked out with your own clothing, like a gi, if you're doing traditional style martial arts. And so I think based on the physical stimuli I was regularly uh, encountering and being becoming conditioned to, that I, it would take a particular threshold for me to decide like the word pain should be utilized here. And then even more important, that the word pain is utilized and then my behavioral response is I should cease activity or engagement in something. Now, because of my experiences of, of being used to being punched and kicked and kind of this conditioned meaning response, so to speak, if we took someone who wasn't used to being punched or kicked and we put them in that situation, then there's a good chance in that context and, and the novelty of the stimuli that they could have an experience in which they would qualify it as painful. Um, and then that's how we see an individual experience can certainly influence from the societal level of saying, here's a word to describe an experience that then gets molded and made malleable to the individual level. Another anecdote would be my wife. My wife's been a pastry chef for over 10 years now. She owns her own bakery. And something that's happened uh, several times over the years that we've been together is we can experience heat stimuli quite differently. And with this in mind, we can go into the kitchen. I'm, I'm from the South and we, we cook a lot with cast iron skillets. I could grab a cast iron skillet off of the stove after use, and I could certainly uh, very quickly decide like, oh, that's hot, uh, and drop the cast iron skillet. And even maybe I use the word pain, that was painful. My wife can immediately walk over, grab the same heat stimulus, the same cast iron pan, and feel fine with it, and say, no, I'm okay. And so she's also, again, had the conditioned response over time of being exposed to that stimuli and have a very different meaning assigned to that experience and then a different response to it altogether. We also have data on this. This isn't just unique to my anecdotes. I'll put the, the references in the citations where we can take people and expose them to the same physical stimuli and they can have a very different response to that stimuli. And this is where we get into like numerical rating scales and rating of symptoms and, and trying to objectify it. But looking at the same physical stimulus, eliciting a completely different response. So it's a very broad spectrum for perhaps they don't even notice anything to they experience what they would label as pain and responding as such. So again, just to kind of summarize this point, pain as a word is something that our society has taught us and given us as a word to apply to various lived experiences, but that word then gets molded and made malleable at the individual level. So I think in this regard, we can think of pain as a sticker or a label in which we're applying to those lived experiences at the individual level. And oftentimes in our regard in healthcare, that label is being applied to the, to the physical body, so to speak. Now, many people say that we need a, an operational definition in this regard for pain. Linguistically speaking, we need to define our term. And so we've been trying to do this for quite some time. I would say kind of where it really started uh, taking off was in 1979, when the International Association for the Study of Pain released an article called The Need of a Taxonomy. And in this article, they give their official universal definition. And so it is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage are described in terms of such damage. Now, the big addition here that really made a difference was the addition of the word potential. 
And this is important because this was the time now that we can realize, oh, someone can have the experience in which they're labeling it as pain, and it's not related to tissue damage or pathophysiology or pathoanatomical issues or very common to the rehab world, kinesiopathological is what people would, would say. So this was an important step in our process in understanding the experience of pain. Now, there have been others over time that have presented their own definitions, uh, potentially out of complaints to the ISP. So Williams and Craig in 2016 released their own definition. And they said, pain is a distressing experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage with sensory, emotional, cognitive, and social components. The big additions here that really matter was the addition of cognition or cognitive, which layers in someone's thoughts and beliefs and previous lived experiences, and then also the addition of social, laying in the societal influence like we were talking about at the beginning that can influence someone's utilization of the word pain, as well as their lived experiences. In 2018, Cohen and colleagues released another definition. This one probably is a little more philosophical than most are used to. And they said pain is a mutually recognizable somatic experience that reflects a person's apprehension of threat to their bodily or existential integrity. Again, perhaps a little more philosophical than most are used to, but there are some very important key components to this definition. The first would be mutually recognizable. I like this addition because it doesn't privilege the observer, it doesn't privilege the clinician over the individual's lived experience. And that's something that we'll talk about with the biomedical model that tends to happen a lot quite regularly. So it's accepting that we're collaboratively exploring someone's experience and then identifying related variables that together we can influence to influence their experience. The other addition would be existential integrity. I know that may seem as a bit of a, a word salad to folks, but in essence, we're looking at the pain experience having the potential to uh, influence someone's existence or their lived experiences. And then on top of that could be threatening to their own autonomy as well as their self-identity. So again, some important components to this new definition. Now I completed this presentation probably about a week ago, and then I had to go back about two days ago and add this, this slide in. I had it where it originally stated the ISP's proposed definition because in 2019, they released a proposed definition and then allowed people to write in and provide feedback about that definition. As of two days ago, they just released their new official definition for uh, uh, pain, a universal definition. So in 41 years, the first definition I read off, this is where we're currently at with it. An unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So the major change here is a little bit of restructuring of the sentence in the second part of the sentence, and then the addition of the word resembling. I think it's interesting to take a second, if you notice throughout the previous slides, I had added in some of those photographs from Justin's BBC article, where he did photographs of people writing in about the persistent pain experience. Now, look at how people have linguistically described their experiences, and then the imagery that's utilized to capture those experiences. And this just demonstrates how vastly different we can have experiences in which we use the word pain as a label towards those experiences. And then if you can potentially maybe pause this presentation and reflect on those universal definitions that were just supplied and how we're supposed to have all of those representations here on this image be fit into those universal definitions, any of them if we decided to settle on it. I think there's a major issue here. I think this is quite complex and difficult to do. I don't think that we actually can do that, which I'm already showing my bias to this next slide's question. Do we need a universal pain definition? No, my bias response is no, I don't think we do. And in fact, I think there's some real risks to giving a universal definition, most especially at the clinical context. Now with the counter argument met to that may be potentially in the research world and policy world, we need to define our terms in which we can to then go out and test hypotheses and do research. So I get that. But at the clinical context, and more importantly, at the individual context, I struggle to see the utilization and the, uh, the benefit of a universal pain definition. My primary concern in this regard, in this context, is we try to fit people to our idea of what normalcy is as it relates to pain. We try to then put them in this box of this is what pain is. The reality of the situation is the individual already knows what pain is. They're presenting to the clinic in search of aid, and they're telling you what pain is. So I think it would be quite invalidating, potentially stigmatizing, uh, and potentially minimizing someone to say, I understand that's what your experience is, but this is what pain is. I think that's problematic, and that's something that we should try to minimize from happening. We should listen to someone tell us what their pain experience is, 
and then collaboratively explore related variables to that experience. That may involve some reframing of the meaning they've assigned to the experience, but I wouldn't recommend going in and saying, well, this is what pain is. My overall stance on this discussion can be summarized from an 1861 article by Latham, The General Remarks on the Practice of Medicine. Now, I understand a lot of people don't like quotes on slides, and they certainly don't like folks reading the quote from the slide, but I think this is an important part of the discussion. These ideas that I'm presenting today, uh, as you'll see in the citations, they aren't unique to me. They aren't original to me. These are works that I've read and then formulated these thoughts based on those works. So I think it would be a disjustice to not give people credit where credit is due. So Latham says in 1861, to anyone who should insist upon its being stated in terms of what pain is, it would, I hold, be a sufficient answer to say that he knew himself perfectly well what it was already, and that he could not know it the better for any words in which it could be defined, Things which all men know infallibly by their own perceptive experience cannot be made plainer by words. Therefore, let pain be spoken of simply as pain. And that's where I'm at. Pain is pain. The person has already defined the experience from themselves, and they're using the word pain linguistically to attach as a sticker or a label to that experience. And then our job as clinicians is collaborative sense making of that experience and then identifying influential variables. Now, hopefully we're using current best totality of evidence to identify a potential variable we should influence. And that'll be a discussion for later in this presentation. With that in mind, I really like something that Patrick Wall said in his 1979 article on the relationship of injury to pain, the John Bonica lecture, right? highly recommend folks go and read that. And he says that pain signals the existence of a body state where recovery and recuperation should be initiated. This places the word pain in the same class as words such as thirst and hunger, which signal not only a body state, but also signal the impending onset of a form of behavior. So yes, pain is a word that is formulated at the societal level and then trickles down to the individual where they mold it to make it malleable to their own based on their lived experiences. But the next step to that discussion would be pain as a word that is an imperative, a call to action. And oftentimes in this regard, an individual's experience where they're not quite sure of the meaning of that experience or what should be done about it is when they're gonna seek aid from a healthcare clinician. And this is where we find them in our offices for consultations about their experience, the meaning of that experience, and then what do we think we need to do about that experience to help them through it. This is where we really start transitioning to that second question, which is why am I in pain? I think we really need to spend time on attempting to continue to answer the question, what is pain? That's gonna then help us influence answering the question, why am I in pain? And I think it's probably gonna help us uh, minimize some missteps in searching for answers to why am I in pain? This leads into models and our framework for looking at the human that's experiencing pain, especially in the clinical context. I know in this regard, some people struggle with the word models. I'm, I'm okay with it in this regard. And I really like what Engel said in 1977. We'll talk much more about Engel later with the biopsychosocial model, but he wrote an article on introducing a new medical model. And in it, he says, models are simply a belief system utilized to explain natural phenomena to make sense out of what is puzzling or disturbing. And that's really what it is. This is a, it's a set of beliefs in which we're trying to understand the natural world. For our context, we're trying to understand a lived experience in which we're attaching the label or the word pain to. And so we're using this to look at that experience to make sense of it. By nature, we are going to have reductionist models and frameworks to operate from. There's really no way around that. Uh, if we see a model in action, in essence, it's just seeing life living life. For healthcare context, especially in the past, I think We've been transitioning out of this, but for a very long time, our healthcare ontology or classification or the existence in this regard of pain was classifying the experience as physical body objectification. So we would place someone under the lens, someone, someone would call this a medical gaze, and we're going to peer at the surface level potentially to find problems, and then maybe I have to peer beneath the surface with imaging, and maybe farther beneath the surface with blood work, and farther down to maybe the cellular level. And so we're looking for the problem to fix, diving deeper and deeper and deeper into the surface so I can fix that problem, correct it, and then we're going to restore the human to whole, so to speak, is the hope. Now, if I, I, I'm positive most of the people at the summit this week, weekend are very familiar with this model. This is labeled as the biomedical model. The, the major premise is the human body is a machine. And as a machine, when it breaks down, we get pain. 
And out of that, when they consult a healthcare uh, clinician, my job as a clinician is to go in and correct the problem in the machine. And if I do that, ipso facto, I'm going to correct the human in front of me. And so the body breaks down, it wears out, the clinician is the technician to fix that. There's a couple of major assumptions that are made based on the biomedical model as it relates to the pain experience. The first would be a direct result of tissue damage or trauma. So if someone has pain, it must be a direct result of tissue damage or trauma. Well, we know that's not entirely the case, and it's certainly not 100% of the time someone can present with pain, and they, we have no identifiable tissue issue or trauma or pathophysiological issue or pathanatomical issue. And on the flip side, someone can have no experience or no pain being reported in their experience. And there is something underlying that we need to influence as clinicians. So that's why it's our job to kind of explore their experience and find potentially related variables that we need to influence, hopefully using current best evidence in that process. But we can't say that it's a direct result of tissue trauma or damage. There's some really good citations that I'll add in uh, that have gone through this process from the 70s on. Obviously, uh, Melzack and Wall come to mind. There was, a, I believe his, the name was Carlin, that looked at uh, uh, post-amputation, soldiers coming back from war with phantom limb pain. And then there was also Beecher, who looked at soldiers as well, coming back from war. And in experiences of which we would see massive amounts of, however you want to qualify that, tissue damage or trauma, and then very large variation reporting of the experience of pain, and then even sometimes as it relates to wanting medication to help with that experience. The next major assumption would be provides accurate measure of tissue status, that pain provides an accurate measure of tissue status. We know that not to be the case for what I just was talking about, but also this really tends to get into when we try to objectify the experience. We use our various scales, like the numerical rating scale, or the VAS. There are others out there, but those are kind of the two popular ones. And so with this, we tend to think, well, if someone presents with 10 out of 10, there must be really something wrong that we need to, to fix for that human. And on the flip side, if they present with 0 out of 10, then nothing must be wrong. And in actuality, I think if we wanted to use these scales, I'm, I'm not a fan of them, but if someone reported 10 out of 10, perhaps that tells me they're not coping very well. And if they present with a 0 out of 10, perhaps they're coping very well with their experience. Now, obviously, the difficult part of that is someone could report a 0 out of 10, and we, we do have something medically going on that we need to intervene on. We're going to have negative outcomes, loss of life, limb, or function. And on the flip side, someone could have a 10 out of 10, and that'd be a, di a very different uh, discussion. So we, as a clinician, are tasked with trying to help make sense of that experience. The last one would be if a physical source cannot be localized, a patient's report of pain is doubted or worse, disbelieved. And so if I can't find a tissue issue, if I can't find a mechanical error in the machine that I can fix, the human that is the machine, then there must be something else going on and it must be psychogenic or a mind issue. I need to refer you to psychiatry or psychology. And this is a, a major uh, issue and a major flaw in assumptions for the biomedical model. Ultimately, what this premise uh, or this assumption is getting at is duality. A lot of people probably heard about this at this point. You know, some people blame Descartes, but uh, at the time, there's a lot of other things going on in history with classical science, and then the church kind of reigning supreme at the time. It's another conversation. But with duality, in essence, the premise is the mind is separate from the body. And so again, with biomedical approach to clinical practice and the human that's experiencing, uh, uh, having an experience where they're labeling it with the word pain, then we look at the tissue, and if we can't find the tissue, it must be in the mind. And then there's this odd, weird issue where we label the mind as the brain, so we still kind of make it a tissue issue. And so unfortunately with this, we say the forces governing the body are separate from the forces governing the mind. And these can lead to a lot of issues. It creates a false dichotomy, unfortunately. And so you have the false dichotomy of mind versus body, but then that transitions into a false dichotomy of normal versus abnormal. And so if my job as a technician is to find a problem in the tissue, that's what I start doing. If that's my MO, an operational premise in clinical practice. So let's say someone presents with acute onset low back pain. Now, they probably shouldn't get imaging in a lot of contexts, but we know that's typically what's happening anyways. And so then we look at the image with the acute onset low back pain person, and we say, well, this looks like a textbook normal image. If we can't find it, then it must be psychogenic. But if I look at the image and I find something, and we, and we know there's something there because there's a circle on it, I said, well, there it is. You have a lumbar disc herniation or a lumbar disc bulge. That's the problem. And that's what we need to fix to get you out uh, of your low back pain. That's how we fix the problem. What does this do? It leads to a cascade of interventions. So we have unnecessary worry on the part of the clinician and unnecessary worry on the part of the, the person, especially if it doesn't start resolving. 
And so all subsequent treatment is geared at fixing that tissue issue. We're going to start with potentially conservative management, which could mean all sorts of things. Maybe we go to medications, maybe we do injections, maybe we do surgery, and maybe you're still presenting with pain. And so after surgery, we just label it felt back surgery syndrome. And so these are the issues. These are major missteps in the process because we jumped to answering the question, why am I in pain? We didn't spend time thinking about what is pain first. Now, it's not just restricted to osseous issues or, or disc issues or nerve-related issues, but we even also will say that about muscles, right? So we have, obviously can't see this, but a, um, you know this is like a normative muscle belly. And then we create kind of pathological issues we don't actually have evidence to say exist in an attempt to explain why someone's in pain. And so in this regard, we may make something up like myofascial trigger points, and we don't have good data to say that's actually a thing we need to even attempt to influence. But if we did, this is my version of it, you know, some weird fractal image that's like folding tissue on itself. And now we have to fix that and we have to intervene on that. And unfortunately, we condition people to think, well, any subsequent time they experience low back pain, then that necessitates me as the clinician to fix that trigger point from them. And their trigger point is returned and that's why they're in pain. So if we reduce it down to this really simplistic thing, even though it's a very, very complex experience, and we do the same thing in other regards. Oh, you're having low back pain because your posture is not right. I, I dropped a plumb line from your ear to your medial malleolus, and you know, that doesn't line up perfectly, and so that's a problem. That's why you're in pain. Your posture is an issue. And if you go on social media, this is what you tend to see today. We have this very green, you know, like normative curvature of spines, right? And then we have this abnormal side where we have red and, and kyphosis and anterior head carriage and all these other problems we need to fix, right? And so I know green is good and red is bad. That's how I know the difference between normal and abnormal, and so we're creating more problems for folks. We do the same thing with lifting mechanics. Oh, there's a very particular way you need to lift, or you're going to get low back pain out of it. That's the problem, you're lifting incorrectly. And again, I know that the correct way is here because it's green on the left, and I know it's the wrong way and abnormal because it's flexed and red on the right. And these are the narratives we supply to folks to explain something that's very complex. We also do this with more modern techniques, with functional magnetic resonance imaging. And we say, well, you know, and we're looking at your brain activation pattern and we've counted the voxels and it looks normal on this side and this is abnormal. This one really hits home for me personally. I, I did my thesis in grad school uh, on uh, developmental coordination disorder, kids who were having uh, fine and gross motor skill delayed development compared to our normative controls and we, we did fMRI and so I, I get it. I understand the appeal. I think my major issue is I hope we're not jumping ahead of ourselves here. And we're not creating unnecessary problems for folks to try to say that's how we have to fix their lived experience in which they're using the word pain. One of the major risks of this approach, even further, is something called stigmatization. I talk about it like the scarlet letter if you read the book in high school in which we're applying a label to someone. So let's say we're still talking about the low back pain uh, individual, the, the individual that's dealing with low back pain. And we say, well, you know, I looked at your imaging, you got spinal degenerative disc disease. That's the problem. Or you have a bad back. Or you have the back of a 60-year-old and you're only 35. And so we start labeling them. Well, that individual is going to adapt that narrative, especially if they trust us. It's become part of who they are. It's going to influence the way they view themselves, the world around them, the ability to act within that world, and their lived experiences in the future. And so Cohen 2011 defines stigmatization as a process by which the reactions of a community to a specific personal characteristics reduces a person's identity from a whole and usual person to a tainted, discounted one, causing that person to be discredited, devalued, rejected, and socially excluded for having a voice. And these are the things, these are the risks that we have when we approach clinical practice with this biomedical mindset. We're going to unnecessarily stigmatize humans, unfortunately, invalidate them, and then potentially give them a, a very bad uh, label. So into the biopsychosocial model, George Engel is the, the kind of creator of this model, so to speak. Uh, this came out in the 70s. And so George uh, Engel was a psychiatrist. And what I think a lot of people miss with this approach is this wasn't isolated to just pain. Uh, when he presented this, it was a new medical model and it was presented uh, for kind of shifting the paradigm in all of healthcare. And then it later got adapted to the experience of pain, which makes sense as we talk about this and you'll see. But I think a lot of people don't realize that, and I hope folks go back and read some of his original publications. One is on a myocardial infarction in which a patient is coming into the, to, to the hospital for a heart attack, and he talks about how does the hospital environment, the nursing staff, 
the physicians, how do all of these folks in the environment influence that person's experience? And so we quickly realize that lived experiences have a lot of influential variables and some maybe even we're not totally aware of. And so he based the creation of this model off of the general systems theory at the time, which in a nutshell basically says no biological system exists in isolation. And you can see from on the left side of the screen, there are numerous variables that can influence someone's lived experience. Now we're obviously often concerned with the person in our office who's experiencing pain, right? And, but we have to remember and try to zoom out that there are multiple variables beyond the individual that affect their lived experiences. And so we can see at the biosphere level, down to the family level, to the two-person level, to the individual, and then we can keep diving deeper, which is what the biomedical model tends to do. We do a research review for barbell medicine. I recently wrote on uh, folks that are unfortunately socially marginalized and how this influences when they're dealing with persistent pain, their access to healthcare, as well as the quality of healthcare that's delivered. Now, even for me, this is easy to forget about where I become myopic in clinical practice, examining the individual in front of me. But there are major societal influences beyond the individual that influence their lived experiences. It's just important things to keep in mind. This is how the biopsychosocial model usually gets implemented in clinical practice. We can see here three silos. We have the silo of biology, the silo of sociology, and the silo of psychology. And people try to dissect out, well, is this biological, is this psychological, or is this sociological? Well, it's all of that. We can't actually cut away these individual variables. It's not possible. Now, I understand when we're researching things, why we kind of approach things from that uh, kind of reductionist fashion. But in clinical practice, we, I don't know that we should attempt to do this, and I don't think it's overall beneficial. But this is typically what happens. We become far too impressed with these kind of barriers we put up and, and silos that we put up around these ideas. I purposely made sociology, I purposefully elected this uh, picture with sociology as a smaller silo because I think oftentimes, oddly, we turn the BPS approach back into the biomedical approach and return back to, is this a mind issue or is this a tissue issue? And so is this a biology issue or is this a psychology issue? And we totally just completely forget about sociology oftentimes. So I think the better way to look, about, look at this and think about it is much more like this. Again, my wife's a pastry chef. She made this for me out of fondant. And so we see that you have biology and psychology and sociology here. And it's amalgamation of those variables. They're combined together. We can't separate them. And so I think this is a much more beneficial way to think about the influential factors and just someone's lived experience. And we're sort of using the word pain as a label to that lived experience. Building off of the biopsychosocial model, we have a natural evolution into a new approach. Uh, at least it was new to me. If you're familiar with cognitive science and, and with philosophy, then this may not be so new to you. Uh, this is called a 5E approach. We, this previously been discussed as a 4E, but a 5E approach or an, an active approach to pain. I give credit to Peter Stilwell and Catherine Harmon, who released a paper in 2019 that first gave me exposure to this idea and started reading about it. Uh, so moving beyond the biopsychosocial model and an active approach to pain, I strongly encourage folks to go read this, this paper. It's very good. But we're going to briefly go through this. Uh, it is a, a very vast topic, but we'll do the broad strokes. So a 5E approach to someone experiencing pain would be an embodied, embedded, enacted, emotive, and extended. Uh, and if you're wondering and you see those words, and you're like, what does all this mean? I want to try to give some context. So embodied would mean we have a physical body that we're encapsulated within, right? But we also have a lived body in which we live our experiences out in life, in which we enact our life. And so we go out and enact our life in our embedded environment. So we're embedded. For me, my embedded environment would be my direct engagement with my wife. But we can, we can take that from a micro level, from my wife and my daughter Lucy, and we can extend that out further. And we can say, well, what about the community I... I uh, and interacting with on a regular basis, the city I live in, the county, the state, the country, uh, the world. And so we can kind of see how that gets extended out. So I'm embedded within an environment and my extended network could be individuals I'm engaging with. It also could be things within the environment that I'm extended to. I wear contacts. They let me see better, hopefully on a daily basis and interact with my environment better. So that's me getting extended uh, with those contact usage. You could also think about it as a walking stick 
or someone that's using a wheelchair, they're being extended into their environment and those are aiding them, right? Becoming a part of them. One very common one could be our smartphones that we use on a daily basis that we influence and influence us as well. And so the next would be emotive. We, we have emotions, we are emotional creatures. And so our emotions can influence our experiences and others' emotions can influence our experiences. For this context, when we're talking about someone having an experience that they're labeling as pain, I usually say things, uh, and this would be like fear. If we're having uh, fear about something, you know, a lot of people like the fear avoidance behavior model. I think it has some applicability some of the time, but I don't think we can say that in all scenarios. But certainly someone is fearful of activity that may play a role in their experience and how they engage their environment. Uh, another one would be like anxiety. If they're having anticipatory anxiety, depression, these uh, emotive experiences will certainly influence our pain experience and then how we engage and enact our lives and our lived experiences and in our environment. And then we've already talked about extended. I got ahead of myself there. So I think if you're still kind of trying to wrap your head around this, there's a really good quote that I took out from the article. And so they say, pain does not reside in a mysterious, immaterial mind, nor is it entirely to be found in the blood, brain, or other bodily tissues. Instead, it is a relational and emergent process of sense-making through a lived body that is inseparable from the world that we shape and that shapes us. And I really like that. It, experiences are emergent experiences, and then in this context, an emergency experience that we're describing or qualifying as pain, and then my job as a clinician is to come in and help make sense of that experience, and then identify variables that we can collaboratively influence, and again, hopefully using current best evidence to decide what those variables are, and uh, not just making up things. So one final point uh, in this regard, to help drive home kind of the uh, inactive approach to pain, I have a video here. And for me, this really helped me uh, grasp this concept and idea of moving beyond the BPS model and transitioning towards an inactive approach. And I think the best way you can do that is just see the living, living life. And in this context, I just want to set the stage, but as you watch this video, I want you to think about trying to pick out those five E's, embodied, embedded, extended, and active and emotive. And see if you can pick them out. And I'll, I'll narrate a little bit for you and tell you what I'm seeing. And then hopefully you can kind of go back and do this exercise again in the future. So for the to set the stage, we have a husband and a wife and a son and a daughter. And they are walking through the woods hiking today. Looks like a nice sunny day. And so we know that they are embodied, they have physical bodies, but they also have a lived body that they're enacting their experiences. And in enacting in this regard, they're walking through the woods. That's where they're embedded is within the woods if we're looking at the micro level. And then they're extended out to each other. But they're also extended out into their environment by using the walking sticks as well to help them as they're going through their hike. They're also holding hands with one another. If you look as they become closer towards the camera, you're going to see emotions. You're going to see expressions. They look to be smiling and having a good time. I think that covers all of them. So if you need to, go back, rewatch that video, try to pick out those five E's. I think where this really helped me start thinking about this a little bit more critically, on more layers or levels, is what the inactive approach added to me, is looking at this from a layered approach. I realize that there's a couple of questions we need to consider as clinicians, potentially self-reflect on our, our beliefs about pain as well as as we're exploring uh, someone else's experience where they're using the word pain to describe that experience. And so the first to think about is how does the pain experience alter someone's internal perception of themselves, interoception? How do they view themselves when they experience pain? Let's say going back to the low back pain context. How do they view their body or their low back or even their spine in that context? And more importantly to clinicians, how do they view themselves when you say to them while they're experiencing low back pain, you have spinal degenerative disc disease, you have a bad back. How does that affect them? You have the spine of a 60 year old. And then how does that not only affect how they view themselves, how does it affect how they view the world around them, their environment, their exteroception? How do they then engage with that environment? How do they view the environment and the affordances provided to them based on those narratives that we've given them from a perceived position of authority, they've adapted to themselves and then out and trying to enact their lived experiences in life. 
Is it altering the way they view themselves? Is it altering the way they view their environment? Is it altering the way they enact with their, interact with their environment and the affordances provided to them? If they see a box in daily living and I've only told them, or I've told them that they have spinal degenerative disc disease, they have a bad back, they shouldn't lift with a flex posture and that there's only one way to lift or the they're gonna get low back pain. When they see the box in their lived world and they go to engage with that box, how are those narratives influencing their engagement? Do they no longer see the box as something they can engage with? It's no longer an affordance. Does it influence their ability to go back to work? Does it influence their ability to live and engage in the activities that they want to engage with? I think these are questions that we should really seriously ponder and think upon uh, as clinicians, especially before we go into clinical practice. With this in mind, something that I really liked that Engel said in another article in 1980 as it relates to the healthcare consultation, our roles are based on the linking of the need of one party, the patient, with an expected set of responses or services from the other party, the physician. Broadly speaking, the need of the patient is to be relieved of distress, rightly or wrongly attributed to illness, however conceptualized. And that's really where I see us fitting in in this process. As the clinician, when someone presents to our office and seek of aid, I think that we have to realize that we're collaboratively exploring their experience and then identifying variables that we need to help influence. And so this a part of this could be, you know, uh, comp compassionately confronting some misinformation as I've heard others say in the past. And I think a good way to look at this is seeing ourselves as guides in this process of someone experiencing uh, pain. And so we had this made up for barbell medicine and I really like it. Uh, it has more variables on there that we didn't get to go into today, but you see the foundation is education. And I really think that the important thing here is we're not talking at people. We're collaboratively having conversations and communication and exploring their experience, the meaning that's been assigned to that experience, and the related variables that we need to influence based on current best evidence. The goal here is as they kind of take our hand, so to speak, and we walk them through this experience that they eventually let go and leave us behind and move forward. I'm, I'm in essence a silent observer for the most part and their lived experiences. They're the protagonists living their life and hopefully my chapter is extremely small and then they can go on and continue to live their life. This is a big part of this is building therapeutic alliance, creating a collaborative bond between you and the patient, the clinician and the patient, the person presenting to you experiencing uh, pain. And so I think through that collaboration and that communicative experience, this is going to just further strengthen therapeutic alliance, building an affective bond, and then moving forward and creating a game plan to help them move them from where they're at to where they want to be, and then move on with their life. With this, obviously, education is going to be an important factor in this, and working again, not talking at the person. But I think it's important that with our education, we should be very cautious and doing things like explaining pain to folks. I know that that's kind of the big thing right now. Um, and I think we just need to be really cautious in our narratives and how people will take the way we're making explanations about why they're experiencing pain and adapt it to their understanding. So it's just something to keep in mind that we should be very cautious in this process. With that said, it's important to realize that we play a role in the indirect uh, learning about pain experiences. And I really like what Beckman said in 2019, pain does not necessarily have to be directly experienced to influence what we think, feel, and do. Rather, humans can come to catastrophize, fear, and avoid a wide variety of stimuli and events based on what they observe, tell themselves, or are told by others. And as clinicians, we see in the qualitative data that we have a pretty high perceived authority position oftentimes, especially if the person trusts us. The things that we say uh, and do is gonna influence their understanding, the meaning assigned to the pain experience, and then learn behavioral responses in the future. So we have a very important role here. We need to be very, very careful in the things that we're saying to individuals. We wanna make sure that we're not perpetuating what I call a misinformation loop. We don't wanna catch the person in that loop and then kind of leave them there. Uh, this is from relational frame theory from Hayes. So you can think of our language as the linkage or building blocks connecting stimuli and events or sense making. 
I think that's a really good way to think about this. You know, going back to people uh, that wrote into Justin, how they talked about their experience in language format, and then how we looked at the images to encapsulate that experience. And so that we're doing very similar things in clinical practice when we're having just the collaborations with people and talking to them about their experience and then telling them about variables that we can influence in their experiences. So just to close this out, I really liked what Nielsen said in 2016 in the article, Pain as a Metaphor. Pain is what we say it is over time. And that, that's really true. It returns back to that, that third or fourth slide that as a society, we are giving construct, we're giving systematic usage of the word pain. And then that, that, that kind of approach is then getting molded or made malleable at the individual level and taking that word pain and applying it as a sticker or a label to lived experiences. So it's certainly both at the societal level down to the individual level, and more importantly, at the clinical level, uh, pain is gonna be what we say it is over time. With that in mind, I like that he went on and said, pain is also the context in which we feel pain. And that context need not be clinical apocalyptical, one of damage, weaponry, and live wires. And that very much is remnants of the biomedical model talking about that. Uh, the experience that way. I think we need to be very cautious in how we talk about the experience of pain and then more importantly, the variables as well that we give that we need to influence for why someone may be experiencing pain. So just kind of closing remarks on this. Uh, the first take home would be that pain as a word, uh, linguistically speaking, is attached as a label to the human experience. It's codified at the societal level made uh, malleable to the individual level, and that we play a major role in indirect learning about pain through our communication and our explanations to folks. And that's gonna influence their lived experiences later on. And that's something we shouldn't take very lightly. So I think we need to realize that our narratives influence those experiencing pain. From the clinical standpoint, oftentimes we're the red tack there. We're gonna have communication with individuals. We're gonna influence their beliefs and their behaviors in the future. And they're gonna go on and tell others as well. And this is kind of how we see how systematic misinformation can take hold and spread throughout a society and culture. So hopefully this presentation today has just given a little bit of insight into this discussion. I really look forward to attending the summit uh, virtually in October, and I hope I have a chance to discuss with you all about this presentation, as well as about everyone else's presentations. Thank you for listening today. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, we do have some questions coming in. So we'll just jump right into it if that's okay with you. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So unfortunately we have a word limitation, so this is cut off a little bit. Um, but do you find a utility in clinical practice to use labels such as neuropathic pain or complex regional pain syndrome to identify a little bit more what happens with your client um, and for the orientation of treatment? So are the labels, do we have utility clinically? I think from the standpoint of explanations, it makes sense. You know, having the word neuropathic makes us think a particular way about someone's experience and then more importantly, a potential variable to influence. I don't know how much that alters all situations, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know that I would use the word neuropathic to a patient um, to explain their situation. A lot of times, like if we're taking the example of someone having radicular radiculopathy symptoms with low back pain, it's really, for the most part, based on what we look at current evidence, not going to alter a whole lot, typically speaking, for recommendations and management. So I don't know that I would explain it as you're having neuropathic pain, and that's why you're having radicular radiculopathy symptoms. Um, I understand why we have that label. Um, I probably have less issue with neuropathic than I would something like uh, neuroplastic. Um, I think is the term that ISPs like presented forth uh, for central related issues. Uh, for CRPS, again, I understand clinically why we have those labels. I just don't know how beneficial it is to everyone in all situations. I certainly think some patients, and this is the hard part of these conversations, is we want generalities. I think some patients would respond positively to neuropathic as well as CRPS. I think other patients wouldn't respond positively to it. So it's this weird being able to have a conversation and mold your communication to the individual in front of you is very important. Um, but it, it's, it's complex. I don't know that uh, it would probably depend on the day of the week that you talk to me and my mindset of where I would lean on, on that topic. Hopefully that provided some insight.
Yeah, no, it was a, a great response. Um, another question. So you were mentioning at the end just the um, how pain is something that's um, codified at like a societal level, and then it's like malle malleable, like like on the, on an individual level. Um, in your practice, as you um, see people perhaps with um, some of that misinformation you were talking about that has kind of um, contributed to their understanding or or even their experience of pain. How do you handle that that misinformation, um, especially yeah. if that information has come from um, people that they find reliable or that they respect? Yeah, this is a, a great question. I, I get asked uh, quite regularly. Uh, it's it's difficult and complex, and I am fully willing to admit that I screw it up all the time. Um, <laughs> there have certainly been times where I thought I had stronger therapeutic alliance than I actually did, and I challenged beliefs a little bit too quickly, too soon, um, and that didn't work out well. Uh, and that happens, you know. It, it's probably one of the few times in which I say, you know, experience matters in this regard. Getting reps under your belt, having difficult conversations with people oddly makes you better at having difficult conversations with people. So it ultimately comes down to if I think I'm only going to see someone a single time, like a single one off consultation, odds are I'm going to go a little more aggressively with confronting misinformation because I don't think I'm going to have another opportunity. If it's someone I know I'm going to work with a lot, then I start, uh, at least in my own mind, trying to think about kind of a tiered approach. So what's like most important right now that we discuss versus maybe some other beliefs that aren't so so great for their context? but not as necessary for me to go after right this minute. And it's just a process and it ultimately comes down to trust, right? Uh, if someone came up to me that I didn't like very much that I, I would label it as like an enemy or something, they could say anything in the world and it doesn't mean I'm gonna listen to them. And so it really takes like creating a kind of therapeutic relationship and alliance and bond with the individual to start kind of breaking down some barriers and addressing misinformation. Awesome. Okay, and, and another question. So you have um, throughout your throughout your um, talk quoted a lot of different sources for pain. So I'd like to just ask, how did you start going down that road of? Because um, many people will be like, yeah, but I asked definition of pain. How did you get started on that road of, um, of of going outside of just the one posted definition and into all of those other? Um, thoughts and definitions from other from other researchers and philosophers and such. Yeah, I think a lot of it was just the people around me. Uh, I had, you know, very supportive mentors who encouraged critical thinking. I was, you know, classically trained as a chiropractor, which would have been very easy for me to fall into very reductionist thinking and, you know, thinking everything that came through my door was this kind of mythical thing of a subluxation and went on with life. But for whatever reason, you know, I was I was in a good position that I was surrounded by positive mentors who encouraged me to think more critically. And then uh, linguistics and kind of analytical linguistics, uh, I don't know, I just fell into it. Like, when I started looking into this and looking at definitions, and then how that influences, you know, our world and influences us, it led to reading others definitions, and then philosophical works like Wittgenstein and others. And so uh, I think at this point, uh, for me, it's a bit of an obsession. So I see something like uh, I, I'm read finishing reading uh, The Birth of the Clinic by Foucault now. And so it's just like, what's the next text that I had no education from in my prior studies that's going to influence how I could try to help someone in clinical practice today? I think just some of my thoughts on on what you just said is I think that that's such an amazing thing and actually something that's really amazing that's happened at um, the San Diego Pain Summit over the last several years um, is kind of getting outside of that, well, this is how I was trained and really not even necessarily challenging or, or dismissing what, what we've done in the past, but really like what else is out there? I mean, it's hard to know where to go. So it's those, it's those mentors and those people you interact with who, um, who can really start to change direction or change your direction, my direction. I'm not speaking Absolutely. For you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's very true. Um, awesome. So we're, we're getting close to the end. Do you have anything that you, because it, it sounds like you recorded this a bit earlier than the beginning of October. Is there anything now after you rewatched it that you wish you would have added? Uh, um, that's a good question. I think any number of one of those, any of those beginning points where I presented three objectives, 
they could be entire courses in their own right, uh, which is really hard, like especially if you're beginning to dip your toe in this like different way of thinking. Uh, these fields are vast, uh, especially philosophy, cognitive science. And um, you know, just pick something and start heading down that direction and see where it leads you. Um, you know, I, I really hope anytime I publicly teach, I want folks to go read citations because I just don't want them to take my word. Like they, you need to go through this process and figure things out for yourself and see how it influences you. Um, I don't know there would be anything specific. I know uh, the only thing that comes to mind is uh, Peter actually just released another great paper I think folks should go read, specifically on metaphor still well. Um, and I'm totally blanking on the name, but I just posted about it on my Instagram feed. But uh, he talks very openly about metaphors and uh, his wife did some art actually that she like drew representations of things that they witnessed in clinical patient discussions. And I think it's a great, great article. I would have probably included it if I would have read it. Uh, it just came out this month. So. Awesome. That is always fun to, to, to get um to get a lead on a new article that maybe hasn't come across someone else's feed just yet. Yeah. Um, okay. So we don't have any other questions right now. Um, so now what we will do is we are going to move over to the discussion session. So the discussion is for everyone who has those backstage passes. So you can head on over to Zoom. Um, everybody else, I thought I wrote down my instructions. 3.30 um, is what's up next for you. So 3.30 Pacific Standard Time um, will be Mark Milligan in the breakout rooms. So if you have... Um, Anything else, you can um, email questions to question at sandiegopainsummit.com. Um, and then backstage pass holders, we'll see you in a moment. Everyone else, we'll see you at 3.30.